everybody. So in this video, I'm going to go over the PowerPoint on Chapter 6, How Do I Read Short Fiction? So we are beginning our unit on short stories. And this week, we're going to focus first on how to read the stories and what sort of things to look for and consider as you're reading a story. And then for homework, you're going to read our first two selections and then there'll be two the following week and then one by another story by itself and then another story by itself so we'll be reading six total over the next four weeks um, but today is just an introduction to short stories and how to uh, use good practices to fully understand the story and fully understand what we were meant to get out of it. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to look at in detail in another PowerPoint, we're going to look at structure. That's one of the first things that you want to think about as you're reading a story. And we've already kind of hit on this a little bit when we um, talked about uh, drama and you know when you read or watch a play there is a story unfolding in front of you and there is often a very traditional and expected um, order of the story and the same often happens with short stories as well. Um, you know, so you have that introduction and you have your rising action and your climax and your falling action and your denouement where everything's, you know, neatly wrapped up and um, concluded. Short stories can do that as well, but they might not follow that same pattern. So you want to watch the plot carefully what happens it's usually the plot is usually spurred or the, you know the catalyst of it is some sort of conflict right it typically involves the main character who we've learned is called the protagonist um and you know that conflict can be between that main character and other characters it can be between that main character and some sort of organization or institution. It can be that main character is in conflict with nature or society. But ultimately, there is some sort of conflict that propels the story into action. And so you want to pay attention to how that is revealed to us. You want to look for that climax even in short stories there should be some sort of moment um, that where everything kind of reaches ahead right um, it's usually related to the conflict <laughs> um, sometimes the climax will conclude the conflict um, a lot of times it's especially in literature for some reason the, the the climax and the conclusion are not exactly happy all the time um, it can be pretty catastrophic <laughs> so pay attention to how the plot develops and unfolds pay attention to the rising action pay attention to what the conflict is and who is involved in the conflict pay attention to you know and look for that climax that moment when everything you know what it's been building towards finally takes place um, but also keep in mind that unlike drama you know short stories can be um, experimented with it would be much more difficult to put on a play that included flashbacks or flash forward it would be difficult to watch a play and truly understand it if the plot did not follow that linear structure 
that we're used to. In short stories, however, authors can manipulate that timeline. And there's no rule that says you have to follow that pattern. Um, you know, and I mentioned the words flashback and flash forward. So a flashback is, you know, when, you know, the, the story is progressing, right, in what seems to be a linear fashion, and all of a sudden it stops, and something is revealed, like, it, it's almost like we go back into the past, and we get more of the story that happened before the story it, itself that we began reading, before that actually begins. I'm sure we all know what a flashback is. We've probably read something that involved a flashback. I'm sure we've all seen movies or television shows that have involved a flashback scene. Um, you can also flash forward in fiction. You know, you can, you know, at some point during the story, you can hop into the future and give the reader some sort of indication as to what happens after the story itself, the story proper ends, the writing ends. Then you, you have some very modern and postmodern authors who will not even stop there at just flashbacks and flash forwards, but who will completely scramble and man manipulate the, the timeline so that things are very much out of order. And Hopefully, they do it in a way that the reader doesn't become completely confused. <laughs> but, but still, you know, a little bit of confusion or, you know, having to re read closely to try to figure out what's happening and where we are in the story, that's not a bad thing. But, you know, if nobody reads it or, you know, nobody can understand it and figure out what's happening, then it was probably too much experimentation with the plot. But just keep that in mind, that it's not always going to be a traditional linear plot line, right? All right, so we're going to talk more about structure in another PowerPoint. The next thing you want to think about as you're reading is point of view. Whose point of view are we hearing the story from? Um, the, the persona or sometimes character who is telling us the story is called the narrator. And there can be different types of narrators. Um, you know, you can have your first person narrator who is the main character of the story and they are also the ones telling it to us. You can have a second person narrator who is, you know, there for the story, part of the story, but not the main character. And then you can have the, um, the omniscient narrators and the objective narrators, and you can even have what we call an unreliable narrator. Um, so there's all different levels of narration, and it's important to consider the source. Consider who is telling us the story. And you'd think that, you know, you would be able to just trust everything that we're being told, but that's not always the case. Sometimes authors like to play around with the narrator and the point of view, and um, sometimes the narrator isn't telling us everything. And the only way we can know for sure is to pay careful attention to what they do share and notice the gaps, notice the holes and the inconsistencies, the things that you know leave us with questions or kind of scratching our head. Um, you know, I think most traditional literature is told either in the first person or one of those objective narrators or omniscient narrators, uh, and they were trustworthy. So it's it's not uh, it's not natural for us to think about not trusting the narrator, but something to think about. But we're going to look more at point of view as well in another PowerPoint. Another thing you want to consider as you're reading is the setting. So we're talking about both time and place when we say setting. And when we're talking about the time, we're talking about the time period in which the story itself takes place and maybe 
even the time period in which it was written. Most of the time, we're trying to stay just focused on the story itself, and we're not trying to think about, um, you know, when it was written or anything going on in the outside world at first. But once you understand the story, it's good to think about the time period in which it was written. But you most certainly want to consider the time period in which it takes place. You also want to consider the location of the story. Um, you know, and something to think about is, could the story take place in another setting? And would it still pretty much be the same story? Same order of events, same outcome? If the answer to that is yes, it would be the same, then maybe setting isn't of the utmost importance to the story. But if you read the story and you're like, yeah, I don't really see this making sense, or I don't really see how this could happen the same way if it took place in another location, then setting is something you need to think about in terms of, you know, what it adds to the story and what it reveals to us about the story. And, um, you know, same thing for the time period. Um, so we're going to talk more in depth about setting in another PowerPoint as well. Um, again, this is just an overview. So setting is the third thing that you want to pay attention to. The next thing that you want to think about while you're reading um, are the characters. Um, and this might actually be the first thing that we notice, the first element that um, we start to think about. But you, you have to pay attention to the characters. Um, how the characters are presented to us is usually a very important element in terms of figuring out the purpose of the story and the theme of the story. Um, and as you start to understand the characters, also notice what other characters say about each other, right? And how they react to each other. Um, and anything that the narrator might reveal about any given character's thoughts or feelings. Um, and it's easy to miss some of those things. So you want to pay careful attention not just to what you are gathering about the character and how you're reacting to the character, but pay attention to how everyone else is reacting to that character and what they have to say about that character, including the narrator, right? All right, the next thing that we're gonna look at in this PowerPoint is um, a handful of specialized literary techniques. And we're going to focus more in depth on a couple of these in later PowerPoints. But when we're talking about characters, one um, thing that you want to know is that there, the term foil. Um, so a foil is a minor character in the story whose role sort of deepens our understanding of a major character. And it's usually because there's a contrast. And it's, it's almost like, wow, you are the exact opposite of this main character. Then you probably want to pay attention to that opposite character. Because learning more about them being the exact opposite will help us understand the main character even more. Another thing that you might come across um, in fiction is irony. You know, an irony is, um, it's one of those things where you don't really know that it's irony until after it's already happened. Because the whole idea behind irony is um, it's going against expectations. So what you think is going to happen, it's like the exact opposite. So you can't really know that it's irony until it's already done. But once you realize it's irony, then it's probably something that the author wanted to draw our attention to. There's also foreshadowing. This is another one where you don't really know for sure that it's foreshadowing until afterwards. But it's, um, it's, it's when 
the author drops us little hints as to what's going to happen later on in the story. Um, you know, if you're reading a story and in towards the beginning, you know, there's a care one of the characters is smoking a cigarette and the narrator draws attention to the cigarette and like especially the part that's lit, the cherry, you know, that they draw attention to how, you know, hot it is and how red it is and um, just anything that focuses our attention on that part of the cigarette. And then later in the story, um, you know, part of the climax happens in a burning building. The cigarette was probably foreshadowing. So that's what we mean by foreshadowing. Little hints that the author drops us along the way and, you know, it's, it, they're easy to overlook the first time around. Um, but if you, if you know that it's something that authors tend to use quite a bit, then ask yourself as you're reading, you know, why would they, why would they draw our attention to that? Hmm. I wonder if that's going to come back in some way later in the story. And sometimes it's a little easier to pick up on it, and other times it's, it, you really don't realize it until it happens later, and then you're like, oh, okay, now I understand why they were describing whatever. Um, so, but if you can pick up on the foreshadowing, it, it, it's, it helps us focus on those bigger moments like we know for sure then that this was important that makes sense um this set here on slide seven we are going to talk in depth about these three literary techniques the first is images or imagery it's when you know the words paint a picture in your mind there's also motifs. Motifs is very much related to imagery. It's when an image is repeated in some way throughout the story. Because imagery itself is just painting a picture. So, you know, if the narrator gives us some sort of description and we can visualize it in our head, that doesn't necessarily mean that that particular image is super important to understanding the story. But if that type of image is repeated throughout the story, then it probably does hold some significance. And then the last thing is symbols or symbolism. Um, that is when an object or a repeated image gathers significance, right? There's an underlying need, it becomes a symbol. Um, and then anything that you can say is a symbol is directly related to the theme or the, the central idea of the story. Um, so it's kind of a progression of images by themselves are lovely and they help, you know, help the story come to life for us so that we can visualize it in our heads. Um, but not all imagery is directly tied to the theme of the story. If an image is repeated, then it becomes a motif, and then that probably is of some significance. If something is repeated so much and it takes on a significance of its own, it takes on its own meaning, and it becomes a symbol, then that is absolutely connected to the theme of the story. But we are going to talk much more in depth about those. Um, and then, you know, just continue, continue questioning yourself as you're reading. Um, you know, you need to think about everything in the story, the characters, the structure, the, the point of view, the setting, um, the, the imagery, the motifs, the symbols, the characters, all of it. Um, and then on the last two slides of the PowerPoint, there are some questions, some critical thinking questions that you can ask yourself as you're reading. And I'm not saying that you need to go through and ask yourself all 11 of these questions, <laughs> but 
go through those 11 questions and that way you at least have some sort of idea of, of, of what kinds of questions you should be asking yourself or what kinds of things you should be thinking about as you're reading. All right. Um, reading short stories is in some ways a lot easier than reading a book or a novel because it is shorter oftentimes really short but they're not necessarily easier to figure out um, in fact it's probably a little more difficult than reading a book because in a book you have so much time to, uh, to explore the theme and in a short story it it has to be efficient and it has to be powerful and effective and it's easy to read a short story and not get everything that you were supposed to get out of it so thinking about these literary elements and thinking about these questions that you can ask yourself while you're reading will help you um, understand and figure out the story a little easier right but as I said, we are going to go into some of these in more depth in the following PowerPoints. Um, so if you have any questions about this one, let me know. Otherwise, you are free to move on to the Chapter 7 PowerPoint.